Hello and welcome to this episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. I'm Jim Banks. I'm your host today, uh, and I'm delighted to have as a guest today on the podcast, John Loomer, who I've, I've been a fan of for many years. Uh, John's been a prolific writer, and then recently he's become a prolific video creator. And it's through that that I, I became a real fan of John's, and I'm delighted to have him join me on the episode today. So, John. Hello, welcome. Good to see you here. Hey, Jim. No, I'm really excited to be here. We were talking before we came on. I was saying that I'm used to seeing John's head in a kind of purple logo that goes from the bottom to the top when he does his talking head videos on TikTok. So to have you just, it, I, again, sometimes you've got beards, sometimes you don't have a beard. So it's always important to know for this kind of what, what we're looking for. So John is a meta ads educator who started johnluna.com in 2011. He has a private community called Power Hitters Club which he set up in 2014. John focuses on the most advanced meta advertising topics and he helps his community look good and reach their goals along the way. He called himself an accidental marketer when he started his business with the hope of creating the freedom that he wanted to spend as much time with his wife and his three sons as he could. And he wanted to dedicate countless hours as a baseball coach, but he's actually now retired from doing that, which is probably why he's agreed to come on to the podcast. So he's now taking short form video <laughs> and AI head on as we head into the next crazy phase of marketing. So John, welcome to the, the podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Jim. No, this will be fun. Yeah, it's, it's getting more and more difficult every year to summarize that bio, which is, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but yeah. that's going on. So you started in the industry, I guess, in 2011. What did you do before that? That's a good question. It, I have a pretty unique story. I think the best place to start was I worked for the NBA, the National Basketball Association, from uh, to late 2005 into the summer of 2008. And there I managed fantasy games, which was an absolutely fantasy job. It was ridiculous. And how I got there is a whole other story that whether or not we go there is up to you, but that was a really critical, not surprising point because before that I was doing jobs I really had no passion in. I was in insurance and nothing against insurance, but working for the NBA, one of the most important things that happened there, first of all, is we worked, we partnered with Facebook. So this was 2007 and that was right when it opened up to all the non-students. So the old folks, and I fell in love with the platform at the time. There are 50 million people on the platform. And I fell in love with the platform that now, at the right. time and a few more than that. Yeah. So I think the combination of that and the fact that like, I didn't even realize this while I was working there because I have no, zero history as a marketer or like I didn't, I was a philosophy major, right? So I had no history in terms of sales or really want it in sales. I was actually for like three months or six months, I was one of my first jobs was as a telemarketer and I was the worst telemarketer that plants ever seen. So that's the only history I had, but realizing when I worked there, I was actually a marketer. Like I was in charge of content. I was in charge of promoting that content, online content, magazine content, some ads, some of the ads we saw on TV, some of the ads we saw in other places. We started doing things in terms of community, which in the very early stages of what community actually was. So was, these are basically seeds for me in terms of becoming a marketer and actually not even realizing that, that that's truly the accidental side of it. So I did that for three seasons. It's an amazing job and I would have done it longer, but I had to move my family from Colorado to New Jersey, which is quite the difference in lifestyles. So we did that for three seasons and this was before anyone was working remotely. I begged them to let me work remotely and it didn't happen. So that was it. Ended up creating some problems in that over the next two and a half years, I'd be laid off twice. And so at that point it was like, well, what am I going to do? And it wasn't that I was trying to start a business, but it was 11 days after I was laid off the second time. And that was, I worked for American Cancer Society as VP of Strategic Marketing. And I, I started a website and the, the goal at the time, and really partially why it was named johnloomer.com is, was just 
to be as like this online resume almost of here's what I am capable of. Here's my history, my work history and how, why you should hire me basically. When I created it, I really had no plans to start a business because I didn't know how to start one. It's just that a whole lot of time in my hands and I just started writing and writing and writing and the Facebook ads focus wasn't there initially. It just morphed that way over time. Like once I started realizing I was at least building a brand and what needed to focus and I was using Facebook marketing and Facebook ads to build my brand. So I would talk about the things I was doing. Interesting. I, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, but never actually had the opportunity to talk to you. I used to do insurance and I actually got set up my first business back <laughs> in 1999 stroke 2000 because I got laid off three times. I don't want right to around the same time. I don't want to be laid yeah. off anymore. I don't want to have some control of my own destiny. Yeah. So that was part of the reason why I set up a business. And I think I think a lot of people, when they do that, when they set up a business, they they have a reason for doing it. And it's not always because they want to run a business. Sometimes it's they don't want to work for other people. Or in your case, you obviously moved your family, you couldn't work re remotely. In today's environment, it would probably be quite cool for you to work remotely, but you only can play the cards that you're dealt with at at that particular point in time. So where, where are you based now, John? Right. I'm in Lovely. the Denver area. Yeah, never been to Denver. Funny enough, I've, I've been to, to lots of um, states before, but never to um, to, de to Denver. It's beautiful out here, it really. Is. I, I always try and, and get my guests to give me a fun fact about yourself, right? So you said you're a philosophy major. I mean, is, is there something else that would, would make people go, oh, I didn't realize that John did that? Oh, man. I mean, I think the couple of things I like to talk about most the the baseball coach stuff was pretty intense. So I was basically a baseball coach for 16 years. And as and for each of my three boys, one at a time, really. And it just got more and more intense as they got older. And I really considered myself during that time as a full-time coach and part-time business owner because I get all of my time and energy was spent there. I, I'd even started a website for it to help promote that brand. And for a while there, that website was doing better than my than johnlimmer.com was. It was crazy. It started way back when my oldest was five years old. So that's, I say, when I started coaching, I guess. And then basically up until my youngest moved on to high school, then that was it for me. And honestly, that was good timing because I really needed to spend more time focusing on the business at that point. And it's, it's, that's been part of the reinvention for me. I mean, when you go 16 years, partially defining yourself as a baseball coach because that's what was on my mind all the time. And then all of a sudden that stops. That was a big change for me. So it, lots of baseball related stuff, I think in my past. And, and, that's and, and obviously in, in your, in your business and with your community, the power headers club, I mean, you focus primarily on meta advertising. I mean, I'm sure I will go to my grave calling it Facebook ads. I don't know why they had to change right, the name, but they did, but there we go. So you focus on um, meta ads exclusively. What, what made you decide that that was what you wanted to do? Was it because you'd done it at the NBA and you thought you, you got a good, good level of understanding? I mean, what, what was it that made you decide to do that? I mean, it, it, there was some comfort level there, but I think the, the primary thing was, and, and it, I take it back. So before I was actually talking a lot about Facebook ads, it was just about Facebook marketing. And until then I was talking about everything like Pinterest, Google plus Twitter. I mean, you name it. And sometimes it was even like personal use. Just, I, I was just finding my way and just write. I wrote almost every day, like the first couple of years I wrote a different blog post. And I think the point, the, the line where it's like, okay, now I'm focusing primarily on Facebook was in spring or late winter of 2012 when Facebook timeline for pages right. was launched. And I just wrote a whole bunch of blog posts about all the various features that, that came out with that. And so a big part of it was just like, I just had so much to, to write about. I was very comfortable with the platform, partially because of what happened with the NBA. I was using it to promote my brand. And then really once it, once I started writing about advertising, 
the big thing for me and my business was once I started talking about power editor. So for anyone who maybe wasn't advertising back then, power editor was what you used if you were advanced with Facebook ads. It was super frustrating and buggy. But if you wanted access to some of the extra features that weren't available through the main way, you used Power Editor and you powered through it. Once I started talking about that, and then all of a sudden, oh, my focus is advanced Facebook ads. And it made sense that that should be my business anyway, because if you want people to actually pay you for something, you need to focus, or that's what I've figured out. I needed to focus on a group of people who are high, deeply invested in it, not just people who are like, and this is fun. Again, lessons learned. I, I, in the early going, when I was like, I had no job, I wasn't getting any revenue yet. I was the only breadwinner, I was the breadwinner in the house. I was like looking for free coupons and stuff for Facebook ads. I would write about that stuff. It would get a ton of traffic. And then it's like, wait a minute. These people aren't going to pay me for anything. It's yeah. just that I got traffic and that's it. So there's it, those kind of lessons learned too in the early days. Like if, if I actually want to be paid for something, I need to cater to an audience that might actually pay me because there is monetary value so, in so get, how I, it can help them. So a, so a couple really, of years after the, the, the writing, you then said, okay, maybe I should create a community for people who pay me to mm -hmm. basically interact with me and also interact with other people in the community. Is that kind of like how you, you came up with the Power Hitters Club initiative? Well, so it started with courses first where I did, so there was no community. And this, the challenge I had with courses was I'd have this big marketing blitz for this new course sell a whole bunch of courses, make a lot of money, and then crickets, right? Or I'd, I'd make money, but it was so inconsistent and, and from also, month to month. The thing I found, I mean, like, it was I had a lot of uh, friends that would say to me, Jim, you should write, you've got so much knowledge, you should write a book, right? And I, I always said to them, look, writing a book <laughs> is the minute you get to the end and you write the end, probably 50% of the, the, the content in the book is out of date. And you've got to go right back to the beginning and just start Re reshooting or rewriting every single module that you have about particular because the advertising ecosystem is such a dramatically fast moving ecosystem. Every single year, Meta will have 50 to 100 new things that they add, things they take away, things they give you in the, the business manager or business suite or whatever they call it now. And trying to keep up to date with it, it probably needs somebody like you who focuses on that all day, every day to be able to then disseminate and say, well, these are the important things. This is the advanced bit. This is something you probably don't need to focus so much effort on. I mean, I think people get sort of analysis paralysis to have so many different features in the platforms that they find themselves using things that really probably they ought not to be, but because they're there, they just use them because they think they need to. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you mentioned the book too, because like I would have been offered an opportunity to write a book at one point about Facebook ads or contribute to it was about to do it. The contract was sitting on my desk and then I decided not to. And I'm glad I did for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned everything had become obsolete, but it's like, I think there comes a point. It's like, where are you dedicating your time? And yeah, I could spend a whole bunch of time writing this book that takes me away from selling products and building community. And yeah, it can help build my brand too, but I'm glad I didn't go that route. But as, as far as the, the community, yeah, first of all, I needed something recurring that was dependable. And really, like a lot of things, it was a recommendation from like a reader. So I'm like, hey, you should create a community. And like, I don't know about that. And it started as like, I, I, I was running these weekly free webinars where you had to opt in yep. to get access to them. And then after a certain number, I said, okay, if, if you still want to continue to get these, you need to be a member. And that was the beginning of that membership. So it started very raw and it, that's all it was. So I, I'm about to hit my 500th weekly webinar. Oh. That gives you any idea how long it's been. And it's, it's morphed over time. But the main thing is it's a community of people to help one another. It's also a way for me to make a little bit deeper connections with people than I do otherwise to, to help them. But uh, yeah, that's really the cornerstone of my business, especially today is like the core stuff gets really frustrating when 
I mean, the stuff I, I created in 2012 became obsolete almost immediately after I created it. And it was, or 2022. Yeah, and it, you know, not, I've, I've done lots of speaking over the years and I look at some of the presentations and I look at some of the things that I was talking back in 2006 and seven. And I'm thinking to myself, a lot of the information in there is probably still relevant if you read between the lines. But I think so much of it is now people get hung up on features rather than underlying marketing principles that govern everything. And I, when all said right. and done, Facebook is just a platform. It's there. And it amazes me how many people think that if you're working for an enterprise business, you're all of a sudden it's a completely different set, set of rules than if you're a small business. And I think the reality of it is, is you're only as good as the people pressing the buttons and, and coming up with the ideas for ad creative and, and angles and things like that. And a lot of these enterprise businesses, if they don't have the right people, there'll be no competition to smaller <laughs> businesses. So I think a lot of people get get sucked into a big business and will always outperform a smaller business. And that isn't always the case. So in, in terms of your community, what would you say the kind of typical person that would be a good fit for the community is how you attract the right people yeah. so that you get people that go, this is absolutely the right kind of place for me. The, 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 the kind of the, the group that's here is the, the right people for me to be interacting with. Yeah. The way I look at it is whether you work for an agency or you run ads for others or even for an employer, um, it generally needs to be in the neighborhood of you're spending a few thousand dollars per month at least, right? For it to be worthwhile. But your goal is to stay on top of everything that's happening right now, right? So the community is a great place for that. So not only am I sharing things that are happening, other advertisers are sharing what's happening. If you're running into a problem, you share it and you ask for feedback and you get that. We have strategy sessions at least once per week where we come together and share what we're working on and problems we're facing and help one another. The weekly webinars and, and also access, access to the training. But the, really the main thing is like you want to stay on top of everything that's, that's happening now. And that's that's the true value of yes, that. It's interesting. I mean, I... I I take part in a lot of like WhatsApp groups for digital agency owners and things like that. And it's really interesting how certain people have got particular issues. It might be issues with vendors or issues with personnel or something like that. And they'll ask a question. And as a community, as a group of agency owners, it's really interesting to see how people are, even though we're all, we're all in effectively direct competition with each other, how prepared people are to help each other. <laughs> because I, I look at this industry as we're only as good as the collective knowledge we have. There's lots of people that explain they've had a really bad experience, right? And they've had a bad experience because the industry's allowed people to infiltrate the industry and make it difficult for them to offer services to clients. I have a, a community called Elite Media Buyers. It's a passion project of mine. I want to make sure that people have got the right tools and knowledge to do the job. So if they are going to set up an agency, that they're not going to rip people off. They're not going to do bad work and they, they're going to mm -hmm. help the industry to grow in it because that, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. At some point in time, Jim Banks won't be around anymore and yeah. John Liu won't be around anymore and the, the next generation of people will be there. And I want to make sure that as an industry, it continues to thrive. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a challenge that advertisers face, meta advertisers face is support's not great from meta ad reps and meta generally. So they need something else. And that's that's one of the things with the community and i think that one of the first things i do is I, I create a video just for that person to welcome them in and one thing i stress is like if you want to get the most of this you need to make connections in the community it's the people who show up and expect everything to be given to them like answer all my questions why isn't this in the training why why can't i find a training for this particular thing solve my problems but they're not connecting with others and that's a pretty key factor in getting the most no, out of absolutely so because working on your own in your own location but you have a sort of smaller team that support you I mean, we were talking again beforehand about how we have remote teams so it's difficult when you're trying to stay motivated and, and you're sitting in office and in an office on your own how do you stay motivated what's your routine look like to stay motivated yeah and i feel like you have to have a routine for me, it, I'm a person of habit. So first of all, like each day is dedicated to something specific, right? So for, for 2023, at least Mondays, that's when I do all of my calls. So no matter whether it's a team call, whether 
someone's book it, booking a one-on-one, -on -one, whatever. I know that's the day it happens. Tuesday is the day we have strategy sessions and I'm publishing a blog post. Wednesday, I'm doing webinars. Thursday, I'm publishing another blog post. And then Friday is a free day where I also do like uh, podcast interviews and things like that. That's the first thing. I think it's super important that with whether you call it goal setting or just an expectation, this is part of kind of the way I'm wired, right? The Like I'm publishing a video every single day this year in 2023. If, if I didn't have that goal, it'd be really easy to to lose motivation and just stop doing it. Or if I was obsessed with what are the metrics, oh, I'm having a, the numbers are down right now. It'd be tough to keep going. But my only focus is I'm going to publish a video today. And the kind of same thing with blog posts. I've I just reached 100 blog posts for, for this year, even though this year hasn't been great comparatively to years past with, with blog traffic. But that's part of my routine. I know what I'm doing and when. It also comes back to like what I, I do with running. I'm not, I, I'm just, I guess I am a runner now. I can't, I can't deny it, but I have a, a goal every year of how many miles I'm going to run. I'm going to run 1200 miles this year. And the only reason I'm going to do that is because I track it and I have the goal and that's what keeps yeah. me motivated. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. So, I, mean, I know we talked a little bit about your insurance yeah. thing. I mean, I, I know I post, I, again, I, I post. I post stuff not because I'm I'm trying to brag about me because it's not about me. I mean, I lost a ton of weight uh, when we went into lockdown when we had the pandemic, and the reason for that was that I was working from home. I'd been working from home for twelve years, right? But instead of the rest of the family going out, they were all there every day, and I was like getting stir crazy, kind of being in the house. So I just thought I'm going to go out walking every day. <laughs> so I started walking uh, when we went into lockdown, and I've really almost like done it every day since then, right? And sometimes it's it's purposeful. Sometimes it's quicker, sometimes it's slower, but I make sure that I get out, get some fresh air, clear my head a bit and do something. So in much the same way that, that you've, you've planned your, your days for Monday for, for your meetings and stuff. I mean, I've made sure that pretty much like the mornings are mine, right? The, the mornings are when I can focus on making sure I take care of mm -hmm. my, my physical needs, my, my kind of mental uh, awareness by clearing my head. So usually by sort of 12, one o'clock, I'm, I'm finished and I can then focus on work for the rest of the day. And that, that could involve calls and, and everything else. Again, I've, I've tried to do the same thing. I've tried to block out time in my diary. And one of the most important pieces of blocking out has been for me personally, and also for any family related stuff. And then the work around that, right? Mm -hmm. Because as much as, you know, I know that a lot of people go, oh, I'm just too busy. I've got all this work to do. Right, the work will keep. I mean, the, you know, there's, there's, you know, you need to more physical and mental well-being and and family, and then Ugh. everything else will like slot into place as a result of that. Yeah, I, I do the same. And like my mornings uh, up through nine o'clock every day, I, I make. So we have an espresso machine, and I make a coffee for my wife, and I make a coffee for my myself. That takes longer than your typical coffee. That's going to be twenty to yeah. thirty minutes just to do that, and then I sit down and I read a book. That's kind of part of my routine that I check off too. Like I'm, I'm not naturally a book reader, but that's something I, I try to work into my morning routine. Then I do a meditation and so that's all part of like my, my morning routine that I really don't change, especially during the week. But you're right, like you can absolutely go stir crazy. And I, I think the biggest adjustment for me and why I have to stay on top of some of the things with my own mental health is once I stop coaching as a baseball coach, I've lost yeah. reason to leave the house. So I could stay in the house all day for days, if not weeks at a time, especially when it's cold. And, and that, that becomes a bit much after a while. So really as entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, work from home people. Yeah. That's yeah. That's one of the reasons why I, go, I attend awards <laughs> events. I speak at conferences, but I also attend at conferences even when I'm not speaking at the conference. Because that's my opportunity to touch base with people in the industry, push flesh, have a drink, have some food, catch up with people like in person, because I think it can be, it can be very sort of soul destroying to be in isolation all the time, just looking at a computer screen. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, unfortunately in our industry, 
I've, I've lost some really good friends who took their own lives because they couldn't cope with the mental pressure mm. of, of working in the industry kind of all day, every day, because they had no contact with people, which for me is, is horrible. So again, if, if you're listening to the podcast or watching the podcast, reach out to people. I mean, again, I think for me, it's really important that you kind of like look out for each other because again, we're only as strong as like the collective. I mean, we need to make sure that we're all good. Otherwise, none of us are good. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, I'm also an introvert. So once the baseball stuff ended, my personal connections took a huge hit too. So I have my family around, which is great. But even that is shrinking because two of my sons are out of the house now. And my youngest is in high school and isn't around us quite <laughs> as often as maybe he used to be. So it's like, yeah, you have to make those, you have to be intentional about taking care of yourself. And part of it is you have to have emotional connection. However you find it, you need it. And it's a reminder. And for introverts, it's probably doubly hard. Yeah. And no, you're absolutely that. right. And, and again, I've, I've met a lot of people in the industry who are introverted. And yeah, I mean, I, again, I think I, I, certainly for me, attending conferences has always been a great way of expanding your network of connections, right? Again, you don't have, I, I, I think a lot of people go with the intention of, I've got to get a, a like a positive ROI. I've got to get a certain number of clients. I've got to, I've got to justify. <laughs> and, and again, I mean, I, I think a lot of people in the past, I mean, that, that would be the only reason they would be allowed to go to conferences. But I think a lot more people are aware of the, the feel good factor of, of attending a conference. Right. And again, I always try and encourage people who employ people to actually allow their team to go and learn and network with other people in their sort of peer group, because it's so important to have those connections. Otherwise they've only got the people that they may work in the office. And, and again, here in the UK, we, we had recently, I think I said, decided not to, to they were building a purpose built office and they paid 150 million pounds, I think to get out of the contract with the landlord. They're basically, we don't need that office anymore, <laughs> right? So they're not going to have a big office with tons of people. They're going to wow. have lots more people working from home. So again, I think it's really important that they try mm. and, and do what they can to encourage people to have the ability to be able to meet somewhere. Yeah, I, I think COVID was a big part of this too, right? The, the last event I, I attended was just as COVID was going through. So it was early March of 2020, and I spoke at an event. That was the last time I've been to an event to at a conference, and I'm actually going, finally returning to the social media marketing world. In February, I'll be speaking. So that's the first, that's four San Diego, years that I haven't been to a conference. Lovely place. Yes, in San Diego, yep. It is, it is. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the impact of all of that goes, a lot deeper than I think we often acknowledge in terms of our emotional connections and how that really disrupted things. It was more than just the sicknesses and wearing a mask and some minor inconveniences. Like we lost a lot of connections. hundred percent. You're too. absolutely spot on. So John, tell me a little bit about TikTok. What made you decide to go all in on, on doing vertical videos on TikTok? Very relevant to what we're talking about. So I think once that period of time hit in COVID, I started losing a lot of my motivation, motivation to sell because of the nature of things, hearing from people losing their businesses, losing their jobs, what, whatever it be. And like, I don't want to sell to you in that case. I really don't. So I want to give you things. So honestly, and also I've been doing it for like 10 years. So I started getting burnt out, bored, depressed maybe. And not to mention all the baseball stuff that was going on too. Once we started getting, I mean, in COVID it was extremely stressful as a yeah. baseball coach, first of all. But as we started getting out of it, I feel like every year was more stressful than the last, just managing parents and everything else. So we had all that going on, losing my motivation. The business was starting to suffer. It was a, a decline that maybe would have happened without COVID but absolutely accelerated as a result of it. And so once I reached the final, the end of my final summer as a coach, uh, it's the perfect timing because 
whatever I was doing at that point wasn't working well enough for my business and my business was in trouble. So what is it that I wasn't doing? Cause I was relying on all the same processes and formats and everything forever. Right. Cause again, I, I didn't start a business thinking I'm going to start a business that's going to be around for 20 years. I just wanted to start a business that's around for a year and then we'll see what happens from there. And then it's still there and it's still there. And then it served a purpose. Like, as you said in the intro, like I wanted a business that allowed me the flexibility to spend more time with my kids and my family and coach their teams and all that kind of, and they did it. In the meantime, I wasn't evolving. I wasn't, I was doing the same things that worked for a while. And I reached such heights with my business that I could even not keep growing. I could lose a little bit than I previously would, and I'd be fine. And then everything accelerated in a negative way. And I, Luke on my team had been pushing me for months to, to do short form video. And I was just so uncomfortable with the whole concept. First of all, just opening the TikTok app and like everything that happens in that app. And like, I open I TikTok, no I went, I'm after I've done TikTok for about five or 10 minutes, I need to go and have a shower. I feel dirty. It's like, not a, <laughs> exactly. I'm not the demographic. And a big part of that is just like, just follow the right people. Don't use the for you. But the other thing was like the perception, right? Of, of uh, TikTok. And at the time for me, and I'm sure it is for a lot of people, it was just a lot of dancing and doing silly stuff and trending sounds and trending things. And I'm like, wow. And young people, like, where do I fit in all this? It doesn't make any sense. So even like when I would experiment with short form video, it wasn't going all in on short form video. It was doing it in a way that made me feel comfortable, right? I would actually do a widescreen recording screen share of something, and then I'd crop it to, to fit within that. It, it was terrible. But it, that, was, that was the extent of my attempts in early going. But it came to a point where it's like, I'm either going to figure this out and turn my business around with the help of short form video, or I'm going to have to find a job, something. This isn't working. So um, it, it, it came to a point, and it was, it was September 30th. So I, I started poking around with it the prior few days. It was September 30th where I'm like, I'm all in. And I even, the biggest obstacle that any of us have and that I had, like, sh first of all, showing my face, being, you know, showing all the flaws that you have and whatever, it, that's a big fear. And, but once it, w once I embraced that I was going to create bad videos, it, the weight lifted, right? It was a realization that I am never, I'm never going to open the app, record a video and have it be good and know how to create a good video without creating a whole bunch of bad ones first. So on September 30th, I created a video that started with, this is going to suck and that's okay. And that to me was the start of it I all. I remember watching that video. And right. yeah, and it sucks. Doesn't matter. It's okay. Nobody died, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And it, it, it was painful, right? So I had fully committed to it. The month of October of 2022, I, I recorded uh, 70 videos. But not only was it 70 videos, it was 70 painfully created videos where it took two hours on average for each video. So really the bulk of my day was dedicated to video at this point. And they weren't good videos necessarily. I mean, they were getting better as we went, but that was the key too. It's like, you have to create and create. Like you, you can't just like, oh, I'll create a video this week and a video next week and they'll get better. Like volume is really important yeah, just for getting is better. One thing for sure. So yeah. And then finding what you like, what you don't like, what works for you, finding your process, all that stuff. So anyway, that, it, it, this was a big turning point. Even though the videos necessarily weren't great, I started hearing from people immediately, especially once I branched off from just TikTok. And, and what I ended up doing and it has worked really well for me. I don't record in the app. I, I record from my phone. I edit externally. I then upload to five different places. And in, in some cases, these are places that I wouldn't have been active anyway. 
if I didn't upload that video. So who cares if it's the same video in multiple places? And honestly, it changed everything. Like the number of people who would then book a one-on-one -on -one with me or sign up for Power Hitters Club or invite me onto their podcast and tell me, I feel like I know you. It's from, from watching your videos. Or people who said, where did you go? Where have you been all these years? Because they followed me way back in the day. And then all of a sudden things weren't going the way they used to. And they didn't see my blog, even though I was still but blogging and whatnot. But you didn't they thought I disappeared. Out. I didn't go anywhere. But you didn't set out with a specific, I'm going to generate X number of like new clients for this. And you just like, you're, you're, the original kind of idea was, I'm just going to like post video every day. And well, it, and that is the other issue with video generally that you have to let go of is attribution, tracking, like what, how, how many sales, how much revenue did this lead to? These days I do have a CTA at the very end of videos that I'll, I will, I will say like, Hey, go learn more about this, go to my website or sign up for my newsletter or whatever. But for the first, probably two to three, 200 videos, no CTA whatsoever. And that was intentional because I only wanted it to be purely helpful with the hope of building trust, building my brand, building an audience, all those things. And if things happen, if I end up getting business as a result of it, great. But I had to let go of the measurement side of it. I wasn't gonna be able to measure it. And that's, that's one of the things like as someone who has had a blog that was really successful for all these years, that was always easy. Like I know how successful my blog is. I know what people do on my website. I know when things traffic to certain pieces of content leads to sales. Not so easy with the videos unless you throw a bunch of CTAs in them, yeah. which can also be annoying. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, that's one of the things I just had to let go of in the early going focus, like not even look at metrics. It's like, we don't ignore metrics, but that couldn't be a measurement uh, for success and motivation because you will be demotivated. Yeah, because I, mean, I, I talk to a lot of people um, who, who publish videos on YouTube and they become so obsessed with the hooks and the first three seconds of five seconds. And oh. again, I always say, well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I don't want to dupe people into watching the first 15 seconds if the first 15 seconds is great and the, the other seven minutes is crap, right? Because that's not going to be good for me. It's not going to be good for them, right? I think the most important thing is if you're adding value, then people will like come back and consume more of your content, right? So the more content you have, the more, right. I like to think of it as like lottery tickets, the more content you've got, the more points of entry that there are for people to find you because there might be a specific problem that that particular video or that particular TikTok can solve. Right. And then from there, there's a conversation that happens. I mean, what's really interesting, I was playing around with Descript and I wanted to chunk some stuff up and I had, a, I think like a seven or eight minute video that I created. And I basically created seven compositions that I posted onto TikTok. I had so many people say, Jim, I saw, I saw your TikTok videos. And I'm like, really? I mean, I look and go, <laughs> you see all these people with millions of views and I've got a couple of hundred, maybe 300, a thousand. It's like, but right. a, a, again, it doesn't matter to me whether I've got a million. It's like if I've impacted 20 people or five people, it doesn't, that, that's the thing that's most important for me, right? Is to, that I've impacted some people. That, that is so important. And really to, to your sanity and to your motivation that you can't obsess with virality, which is fleeting and, and those metrics. Like, yes, to a point, those, those first three to five seconds are important. Right. But what I'm not going to be is someone who has this super aggressive hook with every video, because what it's going to do is you're going to get totally burned out by it. Like I get burned out by it. Like if I follow you and every single video has the same sense of urgency and life or death feeling in that first five seconds, and then especially if you don't deliver on it, I'm going to unfollow you. I tune, yeah, tune out. It's annoying. Got it's good for attracting new ways people, to do maybe, this. but comment this and DM me and, and you got to be following me in order to get the stuff. And it's all like, no, just give me the stuff, right? Right. If it's valuable, I'll reach out to you because I, I, I feel that you've added value, right? But if, right. if you're gaming me into kind of giving you information or following you, then that's not <sighs> really going to be, that's not really going to float my boat really. Right. I feel like there's a balance in there, right? So what I, what I don't like also as a consumer. 
Because if you hit record and it takes you three to five seconds to actually start saying anything, I've, I've flipped through. So it's also, as a, as a, a creator, as someone who is, is slow in my words, who takes a while to get to the point, naturally, as you can see, um, it has been a challenge and, and one, a good one to force me to be more concise, uh, to force me to get to the point. Some, I do script, script it out too, so I'm, I'm more careful about it. Like, don't be repetitive. Find a, the most powerful way to say things. Say things in fewer words. Like all these things where I can get it done within a minute. But I treat those first three seconds-ish the same way I do my blog post titles, right? And I even, it's, what's funny is I recorded a video recently it, that started with, create boring content with the whole point of this being don't create a whole bunch of super ridiculous hooks and whatnot. And then my, the accusations were create boring content was one <laughs> of those ridiculous hooks, but I'm actually delivering on what I yeah. said in that hook, right? It's like, there's nothing outlandish about create boring content. That's like basically my first three seconds or so is this is exactly what you're about to get in this one minute and I'll deliver on it. Just like I do my blog post titles where like, they're so super boring, but they explain what exactly you're going to get in the article. There's John, nothing outlandish about it. And I think people get As exhausted I mentioned, I had you on that. as a guest on my podcast because I've been reading your blog for like forever, right? But I think it was really the top videos that really made me realize just how smart and, and clever you are about the content that you talk about. Right. And yeah, so again, for me, I'm, I've been very delighted to have you on as a guest. Just, just to wrap things up, because I'm, I'm very conscious of, of your time. I don't, I don't want to take too, too much more of it. If people wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for people to get hold of you? I'm like what we're saying. I'm everywhere now. <laughs> so how you find me, I mean, you can, first of all, just to email me, me at johnloomer.com goes into my Zendesk inbox. So me at johnloomer.com is a good place. But Otherwise, anywhere pretty much on social, I'm at John Loomer, with the exception of Facebook, where it's at John Loomer Digital. But so Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and then of course, johnloomer.com really is consolidates it all there. So I even have a custom post type now for, for my short form videos where I expand on them and talk about them a little bit. So there's blogs and all kinds of and content there. So, so for, Lots again, of free for stuff. me, one of the, the most eagerly anticipated newsletters I get is the one that comes from you, right? Because you post, post content all the, all the time, right? So I read, I read through it. Again, even though you're talking about stuff that I probably already know about, right? I just like to have, sometimes it's, it's nice to see people with a different perception on the same thing that I'm looking at, right? To see if I have the same perception or whether I have a different perception. Uh, and interestingly enough, I know we, we talked about it Again, you, you've started to post more regularly on threads. I'm really enjoying threads because it's, it's like sort of Twitter without the toxicity, right? So I hope it continues that way. I mean, we've just opened yeah. up to the European people being able to get access to, the, uh, sorry, mm, to, to threads again. I'm hoping that it continues to evolve and do well. I love threads. And I think though, what's funny is I think those who are in it, are 100% bought in and they get it. Like, th yeah, this is awesome, awesome community. And they see the potential and, and all that. It's, but it's so funny, like the people who haven't been exposed to it yet just don't get it. And yeah. they assume it's, it's just, failing. It's, 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 I think yeah, they listen to the wrong people about not, that. To me, like Twitter, nothing it's a, like it. Yeah, and it's nothing like Twitter. The, what I compare it to is the early days of, at least the way I use it, is the early days of Facebook where I am just completely random stream of consciousness, just sharing some nonsense, right? Which in some cases oversharing, probably less structured, less planned. And part of it is like, there, there's no, there are very few metrics. You can't schedule posts, yeah. which is, might be good in terms of the spontaneity. So people, so best time to I'm post in this on, like, weird place. And you're sitting like, with, with something to say, right? I mean, again, much like you, like I'll, I'll have random thoughts and I'll just post a random thought. Again, I'm not posting it for any other reason than I've had the thought and I want to kind of get out there. Yeah, and the result of that is like, sometimes I'll have like five thoughts go out within yeah. 30 minutes and then I'll go a day or so without posting anything, but that's just the nature of things. But 
yeah, the, the weird place I'm in right now as a Threads user is trying to balance what I love about it right now and that spontaneity and writing about anything with I'm also trying to run a business and to build a brand. Like now they've got the topics, which are like hashtags. And should I be writing just about meta ad stuff, right? And, or should I be leaning into that more than I am right now and, and being a little bit more, I guess, intentional about it. But I do enjoy the spontaneity. I, I feel like there's probably going to, come a time where I'm, I'm especially when we can schedule posts, I just, it's going to be hard. I will probably change the way I, I my, my behavior there, but I, I really love these early days of the platform. It reminds me of why I loved other platforms. Same here. Years so ago. So John, thank you so much for, for being a guest. As John obviously whipped through all of his social stuff really quickly, all of the information for John will be in the show notes, whichever platform that you consume your podcasts on whether that's Apple Podcasts, I, I think we've got video recorded, so it'll be on YouTube Podcasts, which is, I think, replacing Google Podcasts, Spotify, it'll be everywhere. So yeah, so, so obviously, John, it's been fantastic to have you as a guest. I'm, I'm delighted that we've had the opportunity to do this, I hope, at some point in time. Once we've got the podcast up and running and being a little bit more active, we can maybe revisit this and have something that's even more polished than this, right? 